Preface of Dinosaurs with Special Reference to the American Museum Collections. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Dinosaurs with Special Reference to the American Museum Collections by William Diller Matthew Preface Dragons of the Prime that Tear Each Other in Their Slime This volume is in large part a reprint of various popular descriptions and notices in the American Museum Journal and elsewhere by Professor Henry Fairfield Osborne, Mr. Barnum Brown, and the writer. There has been considerable demand for these articles, which are now mostly out of print. In reprinting, it seemed best to combine and supplement them so as to make a consecutive and intelligible account of the dinosaur collections in the museum. The original notices are quoted verbatim. For the remainder of the text, the present writer is responsible. Professor S. W. Williston of Chicago University has kindly contributed a chapter, all too brief, describing the first discoveries of dinosaurs in the Western formations that have since yielded so large a harvest. The photographs of American museum specimens are by Mr. A. E. Anderson. The field photographs by various museum expeditions. The restorations by Mr. Charles R. Knight. Most of these illustrations have been published elsewhere by Professor Osborne, Mr. Brown, and others. The diagrams figures 1 through 9, 24, 25, 37, and 40 are my own. W.D.M. End of Preface Chapter 1 of Dinosaurs with Special Reference to the American Museum Collections by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. The Age of Reptiles. Its Antiquity, Duration, and Significance in Geologic History. Paleontology deals with the history of life. Its time is measured in geologic epochs and periods, in millions of years instead of centuries. Man, by this measure, is but a creature of yesterday, his forty centuries of civilization but a passing episode. Footnote. The records of Egypt and Chaldea extend back at least sixty centuries. End of footnote. It is by no means easy for us to adjust our perspective to the immensely long spaces of time involved in geological evolution. We are apt to think of all these extinct animals merely as prehistoric, to imagine them all living at the same time and contending with our cave-dwelling ancestors for the mastery of the earth. In order to understand the place of the dinosaurs in world history, we must first get some idea of the length of geologic periods, and the immense space of time separating one extinct fauna from another. The Age of Man Prehistoric time, as it is commonly understood, is the time when barbaric and savage tribes of men inhabited the world, but before civilization began, and earlier than the written records on which history is based. 
This corresponds roughly to the Pleistocene epoch of geology. It is included along with the much shorter time during which civilization has existed, in the latest and shortest of the geological periods, the Quaternary. It was the age of the mammoth and the mastodon, the megatherium and Irish deer, and of other quadrupeds, large and small, which are now extinct, but most of its animals were the same species as now exist. It was marked by the great episode of the Ice Age, when considerable parts of the Earth's surface were buried under immense accumulations of ice, remnants of which are still with us in the icy covering of Greenland and Antarctica. The Age of Mammals Before this period was a very much longer one, at least thirty times as long, during which modern quadrupeds were slowly evolving from small and primitive ancestors into their present variety of form and size. This is the tertiary period, or age of mammals. Through this long period we can trace, step by step, the successive stages through which the ancestors of horses, camels, elephants, rhinoceroses, etc., were gradually converted into their present form in adaptation to their various habits and environment. And, with them, were slowly evolved various kinds of quadrupeds whose descendants do not now exist, the titanotheres, elotheres, oreodonts, etc., extinct races which have not survived to our time. Man, as such, had not come into existence, nor are we able to trace any direct and complete line of ancestry among the fossil species known to us. But his collateral ancestors were represented by the fossil species of monkeys and lemurs of the tertiary period. The Age of Reptiles Preceding the Age of Mammals lies a long vista of geologic periods of which the later ones are marked by the dominance of reptiles and are grouped together as the Age of Reptiles or Mesozoic Era. This was the reign of the dinosaurs and in it we are introduced to a world of life so different from that of today that we might well imagine ourselves upon another planet. None of the ordinary quadrupeds with which we are familiar then existed, nor any related to nor resembling them. But in their place were reptiles, large and small, carnivorous and herbivorous, walking, swimming, and even flying. Crocodiles, turtles, and sea reptiles. The crocodiles and turtles of the swamps were not so very different from their modern descendants. There were also sea crocodiles, sea turtles, huge marine lizards, mosasaurs, with flippers instead of feet and another group of great marine reptiles, plesiosaurs, somewhat like sea turtles, but with long neck and toothed jaws, and without any carapace. These various kinds of sea reptiles took the place of the great sea mammals of modern times, which were evolved during the age of mammals, of whales and dolphins, seals and walruses, and manatees. Pterodactyls. The flying reptiles, or pterosaurians, partly took the place of birds, and most of them were of small size. Strange bat-winged creatures, the wing membrane stretched on the enormously elongated fourth finger, they are of all extinct reptiles the least understood, 
the most difficult to reconstruct and visualize as they were in life. Dinosaurs The land reptiles were chiefly dinosaurs, a group which flourished throughout the age of reptiles and became extinct at its close. Dinosaur is a general term which covers as wide a variety in size and appearance as quadruped among modern animals. And the dinosaurs in the age of reptiles occupied about the same place in nature as the larger quadrupeds do today. They have been called the giant reptiles, for those we know most about were gigantic in size, but there were also numerous smaller kinds, the smallest no larger than a cat. All of them had short, compact bodies, long tails, and long legs for a reptile, and instead of crawling they walked or ran, sometimes upon all fours, more generally upon the hind limbs like ostriches, the long tail balancing the weight of the body. Some modern lizards run this way on occasion, especially if they are in a hurry. But the bodies of lizards are too long and their limbs too small and slender for this to be the usual mode of progress as it seems to have been among the dinosaurs. Animals of the Age of Reptiles Land Reptiles Dinosaurs corresponding to the larger quadrupeds or land mammals of today. Crocodiles, lizards, and turtles still surviving. Sea reptiles. Plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and mosasaurs, corresponding to whales, dolphins, seals, etc., or sea mammals of today. Flying reptiles or pterosaurs, birds with teeth, scarce and little known. Primitive mammals of minute size, scarce and little known. Fishes and invertebrates, many of them extinct races, all more or less different from modern kinds. Fishes, large and small, were common in the seas and rivers of the age of reptiles, but all of them were more or less different from modern kinds, and many belonged to ancient races now rare or extinct. The lower animals or invertebrates were also different from those of today, although some would not be very noticeably so at first glance. Among mollusks, the ammonites, related to the modern pearly nautilus, are an example of a race very numerous and varied during all the periods of the reptilian era, but disappearing at its close, leaving only a few collateral descendants in the squids, cuttlefish, and nautili of the modern seas. The brachiopods were another group of mollusks, or rather molluscoids, for they were not true mollusks, less abundant even then than in previous ages, and now surviving only in a few rare and little-known types, such as the lamp shell, Terebratulina. Insects the insect life of the earlier part of the age of reptiles was notable for the absence of all the higher groups and orders, especially those adapted to feed on flowers. There were no butterflies or moths, no bees or wasps or ants, although there were plenty of dragonflies, cockroaches, bugs, and beetles. But in the latter part of this era, all these higher orders appeared along with the flowering plants and trees. Plants The vegetation in the early part of the era was very different, both from the gloomy forests of the more ancient coal era, 
and from that which prevails today cycads ferns and fern-like plants coniferous trees especially related to the modern aerocaria or norfolk island pine ginkgo still surviving in china and huge equisite or horsetail rushes still surviving in south american swamps and with dwarfed relatives throughout the world were the dominant plant types of that era the flowering plants and deciduous trees had not appeared but in the latter half of the era these appeared in ever-increasing multitudes displacing the lower types and relegating them to a subordinate position unlike the more rapidly changing higher animals these ancient mesozoic groups of plants have not wholly disappeared but still survive mostly in tropical and southern regions or as a scanty remnant in contrast with their once varied and dominant role there is every reason to believe that upon the appearance of these higher plants whose flower and fruit afforded a more concentrated and nourishing food depended largely the evolution of the higher animal life both vertebrate and insect of the cenozoic or modern era end of chapter one chapter two of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana chapter two north america in the age of reptiles its geographic and climatic changes north america in the age of reptiles would have seemed almost as strange to our eyes in its geography as in its animals and plants the present outlines of its coast its mountains and valleys its rivers and lakes have mostly arisen since that time even the more ancient parts of the continent have been profoundly modified through the incessant work of rain and rivers and of the waves tending to wear down the land surfaces of volcanic outbursts building them up and of the more mysterious agencies which raise or depress vast stretches of mountain chains or even the whole area of a continent and which tend on the whole so far as we can see to restore or increase the relief of the continents as the action of the surface waters tends to bring them down to or beneath the sea level alternate overflow and emergence of continents in a broad way these agencies of elevation and of erosion have caused in their age-long struggle an alternation of periods of overflow and periods of continental emergence during geologic time during the periods of overflow great portions of the low-lying parts of the continents were submerged and formed extensive but comparatively shallow seas the mountains through long continued erosion were reduced to gentle and uniform slopes of comparatively slight elevation their materials were brought down by rivers to the sea coast and distributed as sedimentary formations over the shallow interior seas or along the margins of the continents but this load of sediments transferred from the dry land to the ocean margins and shallow seas disturbed the balance of weight isostasy which normally keeps the continental platforms above the level of the ocean basins which 
as shown by gravity measurement are underlain by materials of higher specific gravity than the continents in due course of time when the strain became sufficient it was readjusted by earth movements of a slowness proportioned to their vastness these movements while tending upon the whole to raise the continents to or sometimes beyond their former relief did not reverse the action of erosion agencies in detail but often produced new lines or areas of high elevation geologic periods a geologic period is the record of one of these immense and long continued movements of alternate submergence and elevation of the continents it begins therefore and ends with a time of emergence and includes a long era of submergence these epochs of elevation are accompanied by the development of cold climates at the poles and elsewhere of arid conditions in the interior of the continents the epochs of submergence are accompanied by a warm humid climate more or less uniform from the equator to the poles the earth has very recently in a geologic sense passed through an epoch of extreme continental elevation the maximum of which was marked by the ice age the continents are still emerged for the most part almost to the borders of the continental shelf which forms their maximum limit and in the icy covering of greenland and antarctica a considerable portion still remains of the great ice sheets which at their maximum covered large parts of north america and europe we are now at the beginning of a long period of slow erosion and subsidence which if this interpretation of the geologic record be correct will in the course of time reduce the mountains to plains and submerge great parts of the lowlands beneath the ocean as compensation for the lesser extent of dry land we may look forward to a more genial and favorable climate in the reduced areas that remain above water length of geologic cycles but these vast cycles of geographic and climatic change will take millions of years to accomplish their course the brief span of human life or even the few centuries of recorded civilization are far too short to show any perceptible change in climate due to this cause the utmost stretch of a man's life will cover perhaps one two hundred thousandth part of a geologic period the time elapsed since the dawn of civilization is less than a three thousandth part of the days and hours of this geologic year our historic records cover but two or three minutes our individual lives but a fraction of a second we must not expect to find records of its changing seasons in human history still less to observe them personally there are indeed minor cycles of climate within this great cycle the great ice age through which the earth has so recently passed was marked by alternations of severity and mildness of climate of advance and recession of the glaciers and within these smaller cycles are minor alternations whose effect upon the course of human history has been shown recently by professor huntington the pulse of asia but the great cycles of the geologic periods are of a scope far too vast for their changes to be perceptible to us except through their influence upon the course of evolution the later cycles of geologic time 
the reptilian era opens with a period of extreme elevation which rivaled that of the glacial epoch and was similarly accompanied by extensive glaciation of which some traces are preserved to our day in characteristic glacial boulders ice scratches and till embedded or interstratified in the strata of the permian age between these two extremes of continental emergence the permian and the pleistocene we can trace six cycles of alternate submergence and elevation as shown in the diagram representing the proportion of north america which is known to have been above water during the six geologic periods that intervene from this diagram it will appear that the six cycles or periods were by no means equal in the amount of overflow or complete recovery of the drowned lands the cretacic period was marked by a much more extensive and long continued flooding the great plains west of the mississippi were mostly under water from the gulf of mexico to the arctic ocean the earlier overflows were neither so extensive nor so long continued the great uplift of the close of the cretacic regained permanently the great central region and united east and west and the overflows of the age of mammals were mostly limited to the south atlantic and gulf coasts sedimentary formations during the epochs of greatest overflow great marine formations were deposited over large areas of what is now dry land these were followed as the land rose to sea level by extensive marsh and delta formations and these in turn by scattered and fragmentary dry land deposits spread by rivers over their flood plains in the marine formations are found the fossil remains of the sea animals of the period in the coast and delta formations are the remains of those which inhabited the marshes and forests of the coast regions while the animals of the dry land of plains and upland left their remains in the river plain formations these last however fragmentary and loose and overlying the rest were the first to be swept away by erosion during the periods of elevation and of such formations in the age of reptiles very little if anything seems to have been preserved to our day consequently we know very little about the upland animals of those times if as seems very probable they were more or less different from the animals of the coast forests and swamps the river plain deposits of the age of mammals on the other hand are still quite extensive especially those of its later epochs and afford a fairly complete record in some parts of the continent of the upland fauna of those regions occurrence of dinosaur bones dinosaur bones are found mostly in the great delta formations and since those were accumulated chiefly in the early stages of great continental elevations it follows that our acquaintance with dinosaurs is mostly limited to those living at certain epochs during the age of reptiles in point of fact so far as explorations have yet gone in this country the dinosaur fauna of the close of the jurassic and beginning of the comanchic and that of the later cretacic are the only ones we know much about the immense interval of time that preceded and the no less vast stretch of time that separated them is represented in the record of dinosaur history by a multitude of tracks and a few imperfect skeletons assigned to the close of the triassic period and by a few fragments from formations which may be intermediate in age between the jurassic comanchic and the late cretacic 
consequently we cannot expect to trace among the dinosaurs the gradual evolution of different races as we can do among the quadrupeds of the age of mammals imperfection of the geologic record the age of mammals in north america presents a moving picture of the successive stages in the evolution of modern quadrupeds the age of reptiles shows broadly considered two photographs representing the land vertebrates of two long distant periods as remote in time from each other as the later one is remote from the present day of the earlier stages in the evolution of the dinosaurs there are but a few imperfect sketches in this country in europe the picture is more complete in the course of time as exploration progresses we shall no doubt recover more complete records but probably we shall never have so complete a history of the terrestrial life of the age of reptiles as we have of the age of mammals the records are defective a large part of them destroyed or forever inaccessible End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections, by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 3 Kinds of Dinosaurs Common Characters and Differences Between the Various Groups In the preceding chapter, we have attempted to point out the place in nature that the dinosaurs occupied, and the conditions under which they lived. They were the dominant land animals of their time, just as the quadrupeds were during the age of mammals their sway endured for a long era estimated at nine millions of years and about three times as long as the period which has elapsed since their disappearance they survived vast changes in geography and climate and became extinct through a combination of causes not fully understood as yet probably the great changes in physical conditions at the end of the cretacic period and the development of mammals and birds more intelligent more active and better adapted to the new conditions of life were the most important factors in their extinction the dinosaurs originated so far as we can judge as lizard-like reptiles with comparatively long limbs long tails five toes on each foot tipped with sharp claws and with a complete series of sharp pointed teeth it would seem probable that these ancestors were more or less bipedal and adapted to live on dry land they were probably much like the modern lizards in size appearance and habitat footnote if some vast catastrophe should today blot out all the mammalian races including man and the birds but leave the lizards and other reptiles still surviving with the lower animals and plants we might well expect the lizards in the course of geologic periods to evolve into a great and varied land fauna like the dinosaurs of the mesozoic era End of footnote. from this ancestral type the dinosaurs evolved into a great variety of different kinds many of them of gigantic size some herbivorous some carnivorous some bipedal others quadrupedal 
many of them protected by various kinds of bony armor plates or provided with horns or spines some with sharp claws others with blunted claws or hoofs these various kinds of dinosaurs are customarily grouped as follows carnivorous dinosaurs or theropoda with sharp pointed teeth sharp claws bipedal with bird-like hind feet generally three-toed the forelimbs adapted for grasping or tearing but not for support of the body footnote the ancestral types have four complete toes but in the true theropoda the inner digit is reduced to a small incomplete remnant its claw reversed and projecting at the back of the foot as in birds end of footnote the head is large neck of moderate length body unarmored the principal dinosaurs of this group in america are allosaurus ornitholestus upper jurassic period tyrannosaurus dinodon albertosaurus ornithomimus upper cretacic period amphibious dinosaurs or sauropoda with blunt pointed teeth and blunt claws quadrupedal with elephant-like limbs and feet long neck and small head unarmored principal dinosaurs of this group in america are brontosaurus diplodocus camarasaurus morosaurus and brachiosaurus all of the upper jurassic and comanchic periods beaked dinosaurs or predentates with a horny beak on the front of the jaw cutting or grinding teeth behind it all herbivorous with pelvis of peculiar type with hoofs instead of claws and many genera heavily armored mostly three short toes on the hind foot four or five on the forefoot this group comprises animals of very different proportions as follows one iguanodonts bipedal unarmored with a single row of serrated cutting teeth three-toed hind feet upper jurassic comanchic and cretacic camptosaurus is the best known american genus two trachodonts or duckbill dinosaurs like the iguanodonts but with numerous rows of small teeth set close together to form a grinding surface cretacic period trachodon hadrosaurus cleosaurus saurolophus corythosaurus etc three stegosaurs or armored dinosaurs quadrupedal dinosaurs with elephantine feet short neck small head body and tail armored with massive bony plates and often with large bony spines teeth in a single row like those of iguanodonts stegosaurus of the upper jurassic ankylosaurus of the upper cretacic four ceratopsian or horn dinosaurs quadrupedal with elephantine feet short neck very large head enlarged by an enormous bony frill covering the neck with a pair of horns over the eyes and a single horn in front teeth in a single row but broadened out and adapted for grinding the food no body armor 
triceratops is the best known type monoclonius ceratops torosaurus and anchiceratops are also of this group all from the cretacic period classification of dinosaurs it is probable that the dinosaurs are not really a natural group or order of reptiles although they have been generally so considered the carnivorous and amphibious dinosaurs in spite of their diverse appearance and habits are rather nearly related while the beaked dinosaurs form a group apart and may be descendants of a different group of primitive reptiles these relations are most clearly seen in the construction of the pelvis in the first two groups the pubis projects downward and forward as it does in the majority of reptiles and the ilium is a high rounded plate while in the others the pelvis is of a wholly different type strongly suggesting the pelvis of birds recent researches upon triassic dinosaurs especially by the distinguished german savants friedrich von huyen otto jekyll and the late eberhard frost and the discovery of more complete specimens of these animals also clear up the true relationships of these primitive dinosaurs which have mostly been referred hitherto to the theropoda or megalosaurians the following classification is somewhat more conservative than the arrangement recently proposed by von huyen order saurischia seeley suborder celerosauria von huyen the same as compsonatha huxley symphopoda cope family podocasauridae triassic connecticut family halopodidae jurassic colorado family celeridae jurassic and comanchic north america family compsonathidae jurassic europe suborder pachypodosauria von huyen family ankysauridae triassic north america and europe family xanclodontidae and family platyosauridae triassic europe footnote regarded by dr von huyen as ancestral respectively to the theropoda and sauropoda end of footnote suborder theropoda marsh the same as goniopoda cope family megalosauridae jurassic and comanchic family deinodontidae cretacic family ornithomimidae cretacic north america suborder sauropoda marsh the same as opisthocelia owen and setiosauria seeley family setiosauridae family morosauridae and family diplodocidae jurassic and comanchic order ornithischia seeley the same as orthopoda cope and predentata marsh suborder ornithopoda marsh iguanodontia dolo family nanosauridae jurassic colorado family camptosauridae and family iguanodontidae jurassic and comanchic family trachodontidae the same as hadrosauridae cretacic suborder stegosauria marsh 
family scalidosauridae and family stegosauridae the same as nodosauridae jurassic and comanchic family ankylosauridae cretacic suborder ceratopsia marsh family ceratopsidae cretacic end of chapter three chapter four of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by jeffrey smith new orleans louisiana chapter four the carnivorous dinosaurs allosaurus tyrannosaurus ornitholestus etc suborder theropoda the sharp teeth compressed and serrated like a paleolithic spear point and the powerful sharp pointed curved claws on the feet prove the carnivorous habits of these dinosaurs the well-finished joints dense texture of the hollow bones and strongly marked muscle scars indicate that they were active and powerful beasts of prey they range from small slender animals up to the gigantic tyrannosaurus equaling the modern elephant in bulk they were half lizard half bird in proportions combining the head the short neck and small forelimbs and long snaky tail of the lizard with the short compact body long powerful hind limbs and three-toed feet of the bird the skin was probably either naked or covered with horny scales as in lizards and snakes at all events it was not armor-plated as in the crocodile footnote this is still doubtful in tyrannosaurus a number of very curious plates were found with one specimen in a quarry b brown 1913 end of footnote they walked or ran upon the hind legs in many of them the forelimbs are quite unfitted for support of the body and must have been used solely in fighting or tearing their prey the huge size of some of these mesozoic beasts of prey finds no parallel among their modern analogues it is only among marine animals that we find predaceous types of such gigantic size but among the carnivorous dinosaurs we fail to find any indications of aquatic or even amphibious habits they might indeed wade in the water but they could hardly be at home in it for they were clearly not good swimmers we must suppose that they were dry land animals or at most swamp dwellers dinosaur footprints the ancestors of the theropoda appear first in the triassic period already of large size but less completely bipedal than their successors incomplete skeletons have been found in the triassic formations of germany but in this country they are chiefly known from the famous fossil footprints or bird tracks as they were at first thought to be found in the flagstone quarries at turner's falls on the connecticut river in the vicinity of boonton new jersey and elsewhere footnote quite recently a series of more or less complete skeletons have been secured from the upper triassic Cooper, near halberstadt in germany they are not true megalosaurians but primitive types pachypodosauria 
ancestral to both these and the sauropoda. Probably many of the Connecticut footprints were made by animals of this primitive group. Anchisaurus certainly belongs to it. End of footnote. These tracks are the footprints of numerous kinds of dinosaurs, large and small, mostly of the carnivorous group which lived in that region in the earlier part of the age of reptiles, and much has been learned from them as to the habits of the animals that made them. The tracks ascribed to carnivorous dinosaurs run in series with narrow tread, short or long steps, here and there a light impression of tail or forefoot, and occasionally the mark of the shank and pelvis, when the animal settled back and squatted down to rest a moment. The modern crocodiles, when they lift the body off the ground, waddle forward with the short limbs wide apart and even the lizards which run on their hind legs have a rather wide tread but these dinosaurs ran like birds setting one foot nearly in front of the other so that the prints of right and left feet are nearly in a straight line this was on account of their greater length of limb which made it easy for them to swing the foot directly underneath the body at each step, like mammals and birds, and thus maintain an even balance, instead of wobbling from side to side, as short-legged animals are compelled to do. Of the animals that made these innumerable tracks, the actual remains found thus far in this country are exceedingly scanty. Two or three incomplete skeletons of small kinds are in the Yale Museum, of which Ankisaurus is the best known. Megalosaurus Fragmentary remains of this huge carnivorous dinosaur were found in England nearly a century ago, and the descriptions by Dean Buckland and Sir Richard Owen, and the restorations due to the imaginative chisel of Waterhouse Hawkins, have made it familiar to most English readers. Unfortunately, it was, and still remains, very imperfectly known. It was very closely related to the American Allosaurus, and unquestionably similar in appearance and habits. Footnote. It is evidently the dinosaur of Sir Conan Doyle's Lost World, but the vivid description which the great English novelist gives of its appearance and habits, based probably upon the Hawkins restoration, is not at all in accord with inferences from what is now known of these animals. End of footnote. Allosaurus. The following extract is from the American Museum Journal for January 1908. Although smaller than its huge contemporary Brontosaurus, this animal is of gigantic proportions, being 34 feet 2 inches in length and 8 feet 3 inches high. History of the Allosaurus Skeleton this rare and finely preserved skeleton was collected by Mr. F. F. Hubble in October 1879 in the Como Bluffs, near Medicine Bow, Wyoming, the richest locality in America for dinosaur skeletons, and is a part of the great collection of fossil reptiles, amphibians, and fishes gathered together by the late Professor E. D. Cope and presented to the American Museum in 1899 by President Jessup. Shortly after the Centennial Exposition, 1876, 
it had been planned that Professor Cope's collection of fossils should form part of a great public museum in Fairmount Park, Philadelphia, the city undertaking the cost of preparing and exhibiting the specimens, an arrangement similar to that existing between the American Museum and the City of New York footnote the cost of preparation is now defrayed by the museum end of footnote the plan however fell through and the greater part of this magnificent collection remained in storage in the basement of memorial hall in fairmount park for the next twenty years from time to time, Professor Cope removed parts of the collection to his private museum in Pine Street for purposes of study and scientific description. He seems, however, to have no idea of the perfection and value of this specimen. In 1899, when the collection was purchased from his executors by Mr. Jessup, the writer went to philadelphia under the instructions of professor osborne curator of fossil vertebrates to superintend the packing and removal to the american museum at that time the collection made by hubble was still in memorial hall and the boxes were piled up just as they came in from the west never having been unpacked Professor Cope's assistant, Mr. Geismar, informed the writer that Hubble's collection was mostly fragmentary and not of any great value. Mr. Hubble's letters from the field, unfortunately, were not preserved, but it is likely that they did not make clear what a splendid find he had made, and as some of his earlier collections had been fragmentary and of no great interest, the rest were supposed to be of the same kind. When the Cope collection was unpacked at the American Museum, this lot of boxes, not thought likely to be of much interest, was left until the last, and not taken in hand until 1902 or 1903. But when this specimen was laid out, it appeared that a treasure had come to light. Although collected by the crude methods of early days, it consisted of the greater part of the skeleton of a single individual, with the bones in wonderfully fine preservation, considering that they had been buried for, say, eight million years. They were dense black, hard and uncrushed even better preserved and somewhat more complete than the two fine skeletons of allosaurus from bone cabin quarry the greatest treasures that this famous quarry had supplied the great carnivorous dinosaurs are much rarer than the herbivorous kinds and these three skeletons are the most complete that have ever been found in all the years of energetic exploration that the late Professor Marsh devoted to searching for dinosaurs in the Jurassic and Cretaceous formations of the West, he did not obtain any skeletons of carnivorous kinds anywhere near as complete as these, and their anatomy was in many respects unknown or conjectural by comparison of the three allosaurus skeletons with one another and with other specimens of carnivorous dinosaurs of smaller size in this and other museums particularly in the national museum and the kansas university museum we have been able to reconstruct the missing parts of the cope specimen with very little possibility of serious error evidence for combining and posing this mount an incomplete specimen of brontosaurus found by dr wortman and professor w c knight of the american museum expedition of eighteen ninety seven 
had furnished interesting data as to the food and habits of allosaurus which were confirmed by several other fragmentary specimens obtained later in the bone cabin quarry in this brontosaurus skeleton several of the bones especially the spines of the tail vertebrae when found in the rock looked as if they had been scored and bitten off as though by some carnivorous animal which had either attacked the brontosaurus when alive or had feasted upon the carcass when the allosaurus jaw was compared with these score marks it was found to fit them exactly the spacing of the scratches being the same as the spacing of the teeth moreover on taking out the brontosaurus vertebrae from the quarry a number of broken off teeth of allosaurus were found lying beside them as no other remains of allosaurus or any other animal were intermingled with the brontosaurus skeleton the most obvious explanation was that these teeth were broken off by an allosaurus while devouring the brontosaurus carcass many of the bones of other herbivorous dinosaurs found in the bone cabin quarry were similarly scored and bitten off and the teeth of allosaurus were also found close to them with these data at hand the original idea was conceived of combining these two skeletons both from the same formation and found within a few miles of each other to represent what must actually have happened to them in the remote jurassic period and mount the allosaurus skeleton standing over the remains of a brontosaurus in the attitude of feeding upon its carcass some modifications were made in the position to suit the exigencies of an open mount and to accommodate the pose to the particular action the head of the animal was lifted a little one hind foot planted upon the carcass while the other resting upon the ground bears most of the weight the four feet used in these animals only for fighting or for tearing their prey not for support are given characteristic attitudes and the whole pose represents the allosaurus devouring the carcass and raising head and forefoot in a threatening manner as though to drive away intruders the balance of the various parts was carefully studied and adjusted under direction of the curator the preparation and mounting of the specimen were done by mr adam Herrmann, head preparator and his assistants especially messrs falkenbach and lang as now exhibited in the dinosaur hall this group gives to the imaginative observer a most vivid picture of a characteristic scene in that bygone age millions of years ago when reptiles were the lords of creation and nature red in tooth and claw had lost none of her primitive savagery and the era of brute force and ferocity showed little sign of the gradual amelioration which was to come to pass in future ages through the predominance of superior intelligence appearance and habits of allosaurus a study of the mechanism of the allosaurus skeleton shows us in the first place that the animal is balanced on the hind limbs the long heavy tail making an adequate counterpoise for the short compact body and head the hind limbs are nine feet in length when extended about equal to the length of the body and neck and the bones are massively proportioned when the thigh bone is set in its normal position as indicated by the position of the scars and processes for attachment of the principal muscles 
see under brontosaurus for the method used to determine this the knee bends forward as in mammals and birds not outward as in most modern reptiles the articulations of the foot bones show that the animal rested upon the ends of the metapodials as birds and many mammals do not upon the sole of the foot like crocodiles or lizards the flat vertebral joints show that the short compact body was not as flexible as the longer body of crocodiles or lizards in which the articulations are of the ball and socket type showing that in them this region was very flexible the tail also shows a limited flexibility it could not be curled or thrown over the back but projected out behind the animal swinging from side to side or up and down as much as was needed for balance the curvature of the ribs shows that the body was narrow and deep unlike the broad flattened body of the crocodile or the less flattened but still broad body of the lizard the loose hung jaw articulated far back shows by the set of its muscles that it was capable of an enormous gape while in the skull there is evidence of a limited movement of the upper jaw on the cranial portion intended probably to assist in the swallowing of large objects like the double jointed jaw of a snake as to the nature of the skin we have no exact knowledge we may be sure that it had no bony armor like the crocodile for remains of any such armor could not fail to be preserved with the skeletons as it always is in fossil crocodiles or turtles perhaps it was scaly like the skin of lizards and snakes for the horny scales of the body are not preserved in fossil skeletons of these reptiles but if so we might expect from the analogy of the lizard that the scales of the head would be ossified and preserved in the fossil and there is nothing of this kind in the carnivorous dinosaurs we can exclude feathers from consideration for these dinosaurs have no affinities to birds and there is no evidence for feathers in any dinosaur probably the best evidence is that of the trachodon or duckbill dinosaur although this animal was but distantly related to the allosaurus in trachodon see page 94 we know that the skin bore neither feathers nor overlapping scales but had a curiously patterned mosaic of tiny polygonal plates and was thin and quite flexible some such type of skin as this in default of better evidence we may ascribe to the allosaurus as to its probable habits it is safe to infer that it was predaceous active and powerful and adapted to terrestrial life its methods of attack and combat must have been more like those of modern reptiles than the more intelligent methods of the mammalian carnivore the brain cast of allosaurus indicates a brain of similar type and somewhat inferior grade to that of the modern crocodile or lizard and far below the bird or mammal in intelligence the keen sense of smell of the mammal the keen vision of the bird the highly developed reasoning power of both were absent in the dinosaur as in the lizard or crocodile we may imagine the allosaurus lying in wait watching his prey until its near approach stimulates him into a semi-instinctive activity 
then a sudden swift rush a fierce snap of the huge jaws and a savage attack with teeth and claws until the victim is torn in pieces or swallowed whole but the stealthy persistent tracking of the cat or weasel tribe the intelligent generalship of the wolf pack the well-planned attack at the most vulnerable point in the prey characteristic of all the predaceous mammals would be quite impossible to the dinosaur by watching the habits of modern reptiles we may gain a much better idea of his capacities and limitations than if we judge only from the efficiency of his teeth and claws and forget the inferior intelligence that animated these terrible weapons tyrannosaurus the tyrant saurian as professor osborne has named him was the climax of evolution of the giant flesh-eating dinosaurs it reached a length of forty-seven feet and in bulk must have equaled the mammoth or the mastodon or the largest living elephants the massive hind limbs supporting the whole weight of the body exceeded the limbs of the great proboscideans in bulk and in a standing position the animal was eighteen to twenty feet high as against twelve for the largest african elephants or the southern mammoth the head is four feet three inches long three feet four inches deep and two feet nine inches wide the long deep powerful jaws set with teeth from three to six inches long and an inch wide to this powerful armament was added the great sharp claws of the hind feet and probably the fore feet curved like those of eagles but six or eight inches in length during ten years explorations in the western cretaceous formations mr brown has secured for the museum three skeletons of this magnificent dinosaur incomplete but finely preserved the first found in nineteen hundred included the jaws a large part of backbone and ribs and some limb bones the second included most of skull and jaws backbone ribs and pelvis and the hind limbs and feet but not tail the third consisted of a perfect skull and jaws the backbone ribs pelvis and nearly all of the tail but no limbs from these three specimens it has been possible to reconstruct the entire skeleton the exact construction of the forefeet is the only doubtful part the forelimb is very small relatively to the huge size of the animal but probably was constructed much as in the allosaurus with two or three large curved claws the inner claw opposing the others the missing parts of the two best skeletons have been restored and with the help of two small models of the skeleton a group has been made ready for mounting as the central piece of the proposed cretaceous dinosaur hall one of the skeletons is temporarily placed in the center of the quaternary hall space for it in the present dinosaur hall being lacking following is professor osborne's description of the preparation of this group the mounting of these two skeletons presents mechanical problems of very great difficulty the size and weight of the various parts are enormous the height of the head in the standing position reaches from eighteen to twenty feet above the ground the knee joint alone reaches six feet above the ground all the bones are massive the pelvis femur and skull are extremely heavy 
experience with brontosaurus and with other large dinosaurs proves that it is impossible to design a metallic frame in the right pose in advance of assembling the parts even a scale restoration model of the animal as a whole does not obviate the difficulty accordingly in preparing the mount tyrannosaurus for exhibition a new method has been adopted namely to prepare a scale model of every bone in the skeleton and mount this small skeleton with flexible joints and parts so that all studies and experiments as to pose can be made with the models this difficult and delicate undertaking was entrusted to mr erwin kreisman of the artistic staff of the department of vertebrate paleontology of the museum who has prepared two very exact models to a one-sixth scale representing our two skeletons of tyrannosaurus rex which fortunately are of exactly the same size a series of three experiments by mr kreisman on the pose of tyrannosaurus under the direction of the author and curator matthew were not satisfactory the advice of mr raymond l ditmars curator of reptiles in the new york zoological park was sought and we thus obtained the fourth pose which is shown in the photographs published herewith the fourth pose or study for the proposed full-sized mount is that of two reptiles of the same size attracted to the same prey one reptile is crouching over its prey which is represented by a portion of a skeleton the object of this depressed pose is to bring the perfectly preserved skull and pelvis very near the ground within easy reach of the visiting observer the second reptile is advancing and attains very nearly the full height of the animal the general effect of this group is the best that can be had and is very realistic particularly the crouching figure a fifth study will embody some further changes the upright figure is not well balanced and will be more effective with the feet closer together the legs straighter and the body more erect these reptiles have a series of strong abdominal ribs not shown in the models the fourth position places the pelvis in an almost impossible position as will be noted from the ischium and pubis the lateral view of this fourth pose represents the animals just prior to the convulsive single spring and tooth grip which distinguishes the combat of reptiles from that of all mammals according to mr ditmars the rear view of the standing skeleton displays the peculiarly avian structure of the iliac junction with the sacral plate characteristic of these highly specialized dinosaurs also the marked reduction of the upper end of the median metatarsal bone which formerly was believed to be peculiar to ornithomimus this model of the group is on exhibition with the mounted skeleton as compared with its predecessor allosaurus the tyrannosaurus is much more massively proportioned throughout the skull is more solid the jaws much deeper and more powerful the forelimb much smaller the tail shorter the hind limb straighter and the foot bones more compacted so that the animal was more strictly digitigrade approaching the ostriches more closely in this particular this animal probably reached the maximum of size and of development of teeth and claws of which its type of animal mechanism was capable its bulk precluded quickness and agility 
it must have been designed to attack and prey upon the ponderous and slow-moving horned and armored dinosaurs with which its remains are found and whose massive cuirass and weapons of defense are well matched with its teeth and claws the momentum of its huge body involved a seemingly slow and lumbering action an inertia of its movements difficult to start and difficult to shift or to stop such movements are widely different from the agile swiftness which we naturally associate with a beast of prey but an animal which exceeds an average elephant in bulk no matter what its habits is compelled by the laws of mechanics to the ponderous movements appropriate to its gigantic size these movements directed and controlled by a reptilian brain must needs be largely automatic and instinctive we cannot doubt indeed that the carnivorous dinosaurs developed along with their elaborately perfected mechanism for attack an equally elaborate series of instincts guiding their action to effective purpose and a complex series of automatic responses to the stimulus afforded by the sight and action of their prey might very well mimic intelligent pursuit and attack always with certain limits set by the inflexible character of such automatic adjustments but no animal as large as tyrannosaurus could leap or spring upon another and its slow stride quickening into a resistless rush might well end in unavoidable impalement on the great horns of triceratops futile weapons against a small and active enemy but designed no doubt to meet just such attacks as these a true picture of these combats of titans of the ancient world we cannot draw perhaps we will never be able to reconstruct it. But the above considerations may serve to show how widely it would differ from the pictures based upon any modern analogies. One may well inquire why it is that no such gigantic carnivora have evolved among the mammalian land animals. The largest predaceous quadrupeds living today are the lion and tiger, the bears although some of them are much larger are not generally carnivorous except for the polar bear which is partly aquatic preying chiefly upon seals and fish there are indeed carnivorous whales of gigantic size but no very large land carnivore there were it is true during the tertiary and pleistocene lions and other carnivores considerably larger than the living species but none of them attained the size of their largest herbivorous contemporaries or even approached it among the dinosaurs on the other hand we find that setting aside brontosaurus and its allies as aquatic the predaceous kinds equaled or exceeded the largest of the herbivorous sorts the difference is striking and it does not seem likely that it is merely accidental the explanation lies probably in the fact that the large herbivorous mammals are much more intelligent and active and would be able to use their weapons of defense so as to defy the attacks of relatively slow-moving giant beasts of prey as they do also the more active but less powerful assaults of smaller ones the elephant or the rhinoceros is in fact practically immune from the attacks of carnivora and would still be so were the carnivora to increase in size the large modern carnivora prey upon herbivores of medium or smaller size which they are active enough to surprise or run down 
carnivora of much larger size would be too slow and heavy in movements to catch small prey while the larger herbivores by intelligent use of their defensive weapons could still fend them off successfully in consequence giant carnivores would find no field for action in the cenozoic world and hence they have not been evolved but the giant herbivorous dinosaurs well armed or well defended though they were had not the intelligence to use those weapons effectively under all circumstances thus they might be successfully attacked at least sometimes by the powerful although slow moving megalosaurians the suggestion has also been made that these giant carnivores were carrion eaters rather than truly predaceous the hypothesis can hardly be effectively supported nor attacked it is presented as a possible alternate albertosaurus closely allied to the tyrannosaurus but smaller about equal in size to allosaurus was the albertosaurus of the edmonton formation in canada it is somewhat older than the tyrannosaur although still of the late cretacic period and may have been ancestral to it a fine series of limbs and feet as also skull tail etc are in the museum's collections at or about this time carnivorous dinosaurs of slightly smaller size are known to have inhabited new jersey a fragmentary skeleton of one secured by professor cope in eighteen sixty nine was described as laylaps the same as dryptosaurus footnote since these lines were written the museum has secured finely preserved skeletons of two or more kinds of carnivorous dinosaurs from the belly river formation in canada End of footnote. ornitholestus in contrast with the allosaurus and tyrannosaurus this skeleton represents the smaller and more agile carnivorous dinosaurs which preyed upon the lesser herbivorous reptiles of the period these little dinosaurs were probably common during all the age of reptiles much as the smaller quadrupeds are today but skulls or skeletons are rarely found in the formations known to us the ankasaurus podocosaurus and other genera of the triassic period have left innumerable tracks upon the sandy shales of the newark formation but only two or three skeletons are known a cast of one of them is exhibited here the original is preserved in the yale museum in the succeeding jurassic period we have the compsonathus smallest of known dinosaurs and this ornitholestus some six feet long a cast of the compsonathus skeleton is shown the original found in the lithographic limestone of solenhofen is preserved in the munich museum the ornitholestus is from the bone cabin quarry in wyoming the forefoot with its long slender digits is supposed to have been adapted for grasping an active and elusive prey and the name ornitholestus means bird robber indicates that that prey may sometimes have been the primitive birds which were its contemporaries in the cretacic period there were also small and medium-sized carnivorous dinosaurs contemporary with the gigantic kinds a complete skeleton of ornithomimus at the entrance to the dinosaur hall finally illustrates this group 
in appearance most of these small dinosaurs must have suggested long-legged bipedal lizards running and walking on their hind limbs with the long tail stretched out behind to balance the body from what we know of their tracks it seems that they walked or ran with a narrow treadway the footsteps almost in the middle line of progress they did not hop like perching birds nor did they waddle like most living reptiles occasionally the tail or forefeet touched the ground as they walked and when they sat down they rested on the end of the pubic bones and on the tail so much we can infer from the footprint impressions the general appearance is shown in the restorations of ornitholestis compsonathus and ankysaurus by charles knight ornithomimus the skeleton of this animal from the cretacic of alberta was found by the museum expedition of 1914 it is exceptionally complete and has been mounted as a panel in position as it lay in the rock and with considerable parts of the original sandstone matrix still adherent the long slender limbs long neck small head and toothless jaws are all singularly bird-like and afford a striking contrast to the tyrannosaurus at the time of writing its adaptation and relationships have not yet been thoroughly investigated end of chapter four chapter five of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 5 The Amphibious Dinosaurs, Brontosaurus, Diplodocus, etc. Suborder Opisthocelia, Cediasaria, or Sauropoda these were the giant reptiles par excellence for all of them were of enormous size and some were by far the largest of all four-footed animals exceeded in bulk only by the modern whales in contrast to the carnivorous dinosaurs these are quadrupedal with very small head blunt teeth long giraffe-like neck elephantine body and limbs long massive tail prolonged at the tip into a whiplash as in the lizards like the elephant they have five short toes on each foot probably buried in life in a large soft pad but the inner digits bear large claws blunt like those of turtles one in the forefoot three in the hind foot to this group belong the brontosaurus and diplodocus the camarasaurus the morasaurus and other less known kinds all of them lived during the late jurassic and comanchic lower cretaceous and belong to the older of the two principal dinosaur faunas they were contemporaries of the allosaurus and megalosaurus the stegosaurus and iguanodon but unlike the carnivorous and beaked dinosaurs they became wholly extinct before the upper or true cretacic and left no relatives to take part in the final epoch of expansion and prosperity of the dinosaurian race at the close of the reptilian era brontosaurus 
the following description of the brontosaurus skeleton in the american museum was first published in the american museum journal of april 1905 the brontosaurus skeleton the principal feature of the hall is 66 feet 8 inches long the weight of the animal when alive is estimated by w k gregory at 38 tons about one-third of the skeleton including the skull is restored in plaster modeled or cast from other incomplete skeletons the remaining two-thirds belong to one individual except for a part of the tail one shoulder blade and one hind limb supplied from another skeleton of the same species the skeleton was discovered by mr walter granger of the museum expedition of eighteen ninety eight about nine miles north of medicine bow wyoming it took the whole of the succeeding summer to extract it from the rock pack it and ship it to the museum nearly two years were consumed in removing the matrix piecing together and cementing the brittle and shattered petrified bone strengthening it so that it would bear handling and restoring the missing parts of the bones in tinted plaster the articulation and mounting of the skeleton and modeling of the missing bones took an even longer time so that it was not until february nineteen o five that the brontosaurus was at last ready for exhibition it will appear therefore that the collection preparation and mounting of this gigantic fossil has been a task of extraordinary difficulty no museum has ever before attempted to mount so large a fossil skeleton and the great weight and fragile character of the bones made it necessary to devise a special methods to give each bone a rigid and complete support as otherwise it would soon break in pieces from its own weight the proper articulating of the bones and posing of the limbs were equally difficult problems for the amphibious dinosaurs to which this animal belongs disappeared from the earth long before the dawn of the age of mammals and their nearest relatives the living lizards crocodiles etc are so remote from them in either proportions or habits that they are unsatisfactory guides in determining how the bones were articulated and are of but little use in posing the limbs and other parts of the body in positions that they must have taken during life nor among the higher animals of modern times is there one which has any analogy in appearance or habits of life to those which we have been obliged by the study of the skeleton to ascribe to the brontosaurus as far as the backbone and ribs were concerned the articulating surfaces of the bones were a sufficient guide to enable us to pose this part of the skeleton properly the limb joints however are so imperfect that we could not in this way make sure of having the bones in a correct position the following method therefore was adopted a dissection and thorough study was made by the writer with the assistance of mr granger of the limbs of alligators and other reptiles and the position size and action of the principal muscles were carefully worked out then the corresponding bones of the brontosaurus were studied and the position and size of the corresponding muscles were worked out so far as they could be recognized from the scars and processes preserved on the bone 
the brontosaurus limbs were then provisionally articulated and posed and the position and size of each muscle were represented by a broad strip of paper extending from its origin to its insertion the action and play of the muscles on the limb of the brontosaurus could then be studied and the bones adjusted until a proper and mechanically correct pose was reached the limbs were then permanently mounted in these poses and the skeleton as it stands is believed to represent as nearly as study of the fossil enables us to know a characteristic position that the animal actually assumed during life in proportions and appearance the brontosaurus was quite unlike any living animal it had a long thick tail like the lizards and crocodiles a long flexible neck like an ostrich a thick short slab-sided body and straight massive post-like limbs suggesting the elephant and a remarkably small head for the size of the beast the ribs limb bones and tail bones are exceptionally solid and heavy the vertebrae of the back and neck and the skull on the contrary are constructed so as to combine the minimum of weight with the large surface necessary for the attachment of the huge muscles the largest possible articulating surfaces and the necessary strength at all points of strain for this purpose they are constructed with an elaborate system of braces and buttresses of thin bony plates connecting the broad articulating surfaces and muscular attachments all the bone between these thin plates being hollowed into a complicated system of air cavities this remarkable structure can be best seen in the unmounted skeleton of camarasaurus another amphibious dinosaur the scientific name camarasaurus equals chambered lizard has reference to this peculiarity of construction the teeth of the brontosaurus indicate that it was an herbivorous animal feeding on soft vegetable food three opinions as to the habitat of amphibious dinosaurs have been held by scientific authorities the first advocated by professor owen who described the first specimens found sixty years ago eighteen forty one through sixty and supported especially by professor cope has been most generally adopted this regards the animals as spending their lives entirely in shallow water partly immersed wading about on the bottom or perhaps occasionally swimming but unable to emerge entirely upon dry land footnote professor williston makes the following criticism of this theory i cannot agree with this view the animals must have laid their eggs upon land for the reason that reptile eggs cannot hatch in water s w w but with deference to williston's high authority i may note that there is no evidence that the sauropoda were egg-laying reptiles they or some of them may have been viviparous like the ichthyosaurus End of footnote. more recently professor osborne has advocated the view that they resorted occasionally to the land for egg-laying or other purposes and still more recently the view has been taken by mr riggs and the late professor hatcher that they were chiefly terrestrial animals the writer inclines to the view of owen and cope 
whose unequalled knowledge of comparative anatomy renders their opinion on this doubtful question especially authoritative the contrast between the massive structure of the limb bones ribs and tail and the light construction of the backbone neck and skull suggests that the animal was amphibious living chiefly in shallow water where it could wade about on the bottom feeding upon the abundant vegetation of the coastal swamps and marshes and pretty much out of reach of the powerful and active carnivorous dinosaurs which were its principal enemies the water would buoy up the massive body and prevent its weight from pressing too heavily on the imperfect joints of the limb and foot bones which were covered during life with thick cartilage like the joints of whales sea lizards and other aquatic animals if the full weight of the animal came on these imperfect joints the cartilage would yield and the ends of the bones would grind against each other thus preventing the limb from moving without tearing the joint to pieces the massive solid limb and foot bones weighted the limbs while immersed in water and served the same purpose as the lead in a diver's shoes enabling the brontosaurus to walk about firmly and securely under water on the other hand the joints of the neck and back are exceptionally broad well fitting and covered with a much thinner surface of cartilage the pressure was thus much better distributed over the joint and the full weight of the part of the animal above water reduced as it was by the cellular construction of the bones might be borne on these joints without the cartilage giving way looking at the mounted skeleton we may see that if a line be drawn from the hip joint to the shoulder blade all the bones below this are massive all above including neck and head are lightly constructed this line may be taken to indicate the average water line so to speak of this leviathan of the shallows the long neck would enable the animal however to wade to a considerable depth and it might forage for food either in the branches or the tops of trees or more probably among the soft succulent water plants of the bottom the row of short spoon-shaped stubby teeth around the front of the mouth would serve to bite or pull off soft leaves and water plants but the animal evidently could not masticate its food and must have swallowed it without chewing as do modern reptiles and birds the brain case occupies only a small part of the back of the skull so that the brain must have been small even for a reptile and its organization as inferred from the form of the brain case indicates a very low grade of intelligence much larger than the brain proper was the spinal cord especially in the region of the sacrum controlling most of the reflex and involuntary actions of the huge organism hence we can best regard the brontosaurus as a great slow-moving animal automaton a vast storehouse of organized matter directed chiefly or solely by instinct and to a very limited degree if at all by conscious intelligence its huge size and its imperfect organization compared with the great quadrupeds of today rendered its movements slow and clumsy its small and low brain shows that it must have been automatic instinctive and unintelligent composition of the brontosaurus skeleton 
the principal specimen number 460 is from the nine mile crossing of the little medicine bow river wyoming it consists of the fifth sixth and eighth to thirteenth cervical vertebrae first to ninth dorsal and third to nineteenth caudal vertebrae all the ribs both coracoids parts of sacrum and ilia both ischia in pubes left femur and astragalus and part of left fibula the backbone and most of the neck of this specimen were found articulated together in the quarry the ribs of one side in position the remainder of the bones scattered around them and some of the tail bones weathered out on the surface from number 222 found at como bluffs wyoming were supplied the right scapula tenth dorsal vertebra and right femur and tibia number 339 from bone cabin quarry wyoming supplied the 20th to 40th caudal vertebrae number 592 from the same locality the metatarsals of the right hind foot and a few toe bones are supplied from other specimens the remainder of the skeleton is modeled in plaster the scapula humerus radius and ulna from the skeleton in the yale museum the rest principally from specimens in our own collections the modeling of the skull is based partly upon specimens in the yale museum but principally upon the complete skull of morosaurus shown in another case mounted by a herman completed february tenth nineteen o five diplodocus the diplodocus nearly equaled the brontosaurus in bulk and exceeded it in length a skeleton in the carnegie museum at pittsburgh measures eighty seven feet in total length although the mount is composed from several individuals these proportions are probably not far from correct the skull is smaller and differently shaped and the teeth are of quite different type in the american museum of natural history a partial skeleton is exhibited in the wall case to the left of the entrance of the dinosaur hall and in an a case nearby are skulls of diplodocus and morosaurus and a model of the skull of brontosaurus the diplodocus skull is widely different from the other two in size and proportions and in the characters of teeth when the first remains of these amphibious dinosaurs were found in the oxford clays of england they were considered by Richard Owen to be related to the crocodiles and named Opisthocelia. Subsequently, the finding of complete skeletons in this country led Cope and Marsh to place them with the true dinosaurs, and the latter named them Sauropoda. Footnote european paleontologists especially huxley and seeley in england had also recognized their true relationships and seeley's term cetiosauria has precedence over sauropoda although the latter is in common use End of footnote. remains of these animals have also been found in india in german east africa in madagascar and in south america so that they were evidently widely distributed in the northern world they survived until the comanchic or lower cretaceous period but in the southern continents they may have lived on into the upper cretaceous or true cretacic 
some of the remains recently found in german east africa indicate an animal exceeding either brontosaurus or diplodocus in bulk at the date of writing this handbook only preliminary accounts have been given of the marvelous finds made near tendaguru by the expedition from berlin from these it appears that in length of neck and forelimb this east african dinosaur greatly exceeded either brontosaurus or diplodocus the hinder parts of the skeleton however were relatively small the proportions and measurements given tally closely with the american brachiosaurus a gigantic sauropod whose incomplete remains are preserved in the field museum in chicago and to this genus the berlin authorities now refer their largest and finest skeleton if the berlin specimens are correctly referred to brachiosaurus they indicate an animal somewhat exceeding diplodocus or brontosaurus in total bulk but distinguished by much longer forelimbs and an immensely long neck a giraffe-like wader adapted to take refuge in deeper waters more out of reach of the fierce carnivores of the land footnote it is of interest to observe that in this group of sauropoda the brachiosauridae the neural spines of the vertebrae are much simpler and narrower than in the brontosaurus or diplodocus the attachments were thus less extensive for the muscles of the back indicating that these muscles were less powerful this difference is correlated by professor williston with the longer forelimbs of the brachiosaurus as signifying that the animal was less able as indeed he had less need to rise up on the hind limbs in comparison with diplodocus or brontosaurus